Anti Parasitics Part 2 of 3. Good news and bad news. Good news, some of these ones, especially the anti protozoal para anti parasitics, you've already heard a lot about. Bad news, there's a lot of drugs still <laughs> to learn, but we will get through it together. So we'll start off with heartworm drugs. When we're talking about heartworm drugs, we're focusing on mainly three classes of drugs plus doxycycline. So we've got adulticides, microfilaricides, and then heartworm preventives or preventatives. Doxycycline, we've talked about previously, it's a tetracycline antibiotic. We'll talk about it once again because it sort of supports the heartworm um, killing process per se. So looking at the heartworm life cycle, it's always good to review. So the mosquito feeds ingesting microfilaria from an infected host. The microfilaria matures in the mosquito to infective L3 larva two weeks post-infection. The infective larva are then deposited during subsequent bites and they migrate through the wound into the host. Most L3 uh, larva blah, <laughs> mature to L4 in subcutaneous tissues in one to three days. The L4 larva migrate through tissues and mature to sexually immature or adolescent adults in 50 to 70 days. Sexually immature worms migrate to the heart and the lungs as early as 70 days post-infection, and then the worms develop to sexual maturity, primarily in the pulmonary artery. So that is the heartworm cycle. Then, of course, the microfilaria appear in the blood as early as six months after the infection. And this just continues and continues and continues. Things to consider with heartworm, the main goal is prevention, and many heartworm prevention products are potentially deadly if the animal has a current, well-developed heartworm infection. So if the animal has a full-on burden of heartworms living in their heart and in the arteries toward their lungs, if we give them some of these preventions, it can actually kill them, sadly. So what we need to know both the disease and the treatment can be deadly, so we need to know our products quite well. Why are the treatments potentially deadly? Well, what happens when these adult heartworms die? So when these heartworms die, they're broken down and circulate through the pulmonary arteries. These emboli, so these pieces, can get, if that should say get, can get lodged in small capillaries and arteries causing a local inflammatory reaction. If significant enough, the inflammatory reaction will cause a deadly narrowing of those vessels. Likewise, the physical presence of the degenerated worms, like the heavy burden essentially, can physically block the vessels. So if we give the wrong product and it's not staggered enough and it just causes a mass, a mass death of heartworms, we're in big trouble. So looking at the American Heartworm Society recommendations, they recommend year-round chemoprophylactic drug prevention. They recommend that you test prior to administration and perform an annual antigen test and microfilaria test. There's the different stages of the life cycle require different drugs, and then we'll start talking about adulticides versus microfilariacides. Now, that being said, we're up in Canada, of course, when we're, we're looking at these PowerPoints and these lessons. We don't necessarily have year-round heartworm prevention at this point. So in Ontario, in southern Ontario, we're starting to see more heartworm coming about. However, it's not as much as they have in the states and especially throughout the, the southern states. So their recommendations are significantly different, but they do have heartworm all over the states, including in the northern states. So who knows what will come our way. So of course, when we talk about heartworm, you guys will learn all about heartworm in the clinics because we have this thing called heartworm season where you go kind of psycho for three months because everybody's coming into the clinic to get their heartworm test done and to get their heartworm prevention picked up. It gets insane. At, before we start getting into the different types of heartworm drugs and preventions, there's always reason that heartworm preventions will fail and heartworm medications will fail. Things to note about it, the treatment fails. Normally it's typically due to poor client compliance. And then with that, we get little resistant subpopulations of these parasites emerging. 
And in general, we don't recommend slow kill methods for parasite for uh, heartworms. So we'll come back to these. Um, it was the macrolides that we'll talk about later in regard to this continuous slow kill. But there are definitely treatment fails when it comes to treating the actual adult heartworms, treating the microfilaria, and then of course prevention. So a little bit of terminology, to effectively eliminate heartworm from the mammalian host, multiple drugs affecting different stages of the life cycle must be used. An adulticide is a drug used to kill mature or adult heartworms that live in the right chambers of the heart. Microfilaricides <clears throat> are drugs used to kill the circulating microfilaria produced by the adult heartworms. Let's have a look at heartworm adulticides. So there used to be one on the market a long time ago called Caparsalate. It had some pretty bad side effects and it was expensive and not ideal. So we tend not to ever, ever use Caparsalate anymore. However, it's good to know about it just in case somebody references it. The newer adulticide is Malarsamine, also known as its trade name, Amidicide. This is an organic, uh, arse sorry, organic arsenical adulticide, so looking at essentially arsenic as an ingredient, and it's a deep intramuscular injection given twice, 24 hours apart. Now that being said, that protocol could change at any point, so always, always, always reference the drug insert before you give one of these medications. The drug itself, imidacide, has really specific instructions for use. So if you're using this, of course you're using it on a dog that is totally heartworm positive. They have adult heartworms in the right side of their heart. And we're going to give this deep intramuscularly. The company recommends specifically the apaxial muscles. So those are the big tube, really thick tube of muscles that surround the spine. And they want you to give it between the third and fifth lumbar vertebrae in the apaxial muscles, one to two inches lateral to the dorsal spinous process. So just offside from the spine. Dogs less than 10 kilos use a 23 gauge needle with a one inch. Dogs greater than 10 kilos, 22 gauge with one and a half inch, and inject all the drug before removing your needle. Side effects, pain and swelling at the injection site. That's the most common side effect. Gagging, coughing, lethargy, pulmonary congestion, as well as a secondary side effect. So the reason for a couple of these recommendations, definitely it stings like an absolute son of a gun and it's very painful and it's very irritating to the tissues. So the reason they recommend that you inject all the drug before bringing your needle out is so that you don't track that painful, irritating product throughout the apaxial muscles, that you give it in one area in the belly of the muscle and you're not sort of dragging it through the tissues to irritate other tissues. Pain and swelling at the injection site, that is what it is. The gagging, coughing, lethargy, and pulmonary congestions, this one's interesting. And they have a really hard time identifying, is it the drug itself that causes these side effects, or is it just the side effects of killing off the parasites and causing some of that localized congestion? So who knows? I don't know. Um, it's something that's debated widely. With this, after the injection, even before the injection, six weeks of strict exercise restriction. So after the injection, for sure, six weeks of strict exercise restriction. The goal of this is to reduce the risk of embolism and pulmonary inflammation. So we know that animals who are sort of breaking down those adult heartworms, the faster they run, the more sort of exertion they put on their heart, it essentially causes a rush of blood and that can just really jam up their valves in their heart if they have a ton of broken down heartworms. If we let them go running and they have great force within the blood in their heart, then it can cause essentially like a traffic jam at their heart valves and it can cause failure. Even before they get their injection, you really should be restricting exercise because we have to keep in mind that these dogs 
do not have their normal capacity within the right side of their heart. Their right side of their heart is filled with worms. So we don't want to push them to their limits. Prednisone, which is a glu glucocorticoid, and antihistamines are often recommended to reduce the anaphylactic risk. So we know that when heartworms break down, there's potential that they can cause a um, anaphylactic allergic reaction, and likewise, an inflammatory reaction, which is where the glucocorticoids come in. So we want to reduce the inflammation as much as possible, otherwise those vessels around the heart can get seriously inflamed, and of course that can cause failure as well. Treatment is also significantly more effective and safer when we pair this treatment with doxycycline, which is a um, tetracycline antibiotic, which we talked about previously and we'll loop back and talk about again. So in the past, they have created an option that is moxidectin and imidacloprid, as well as doxycycline as an adulticide protocol for slow kill protocols. In general, the American Heartworm Association or Society doesn't recommend slow treatment or slow kill protocols for heartworm. There's reasons for this. We'll loop back to this when we start talking about sort of the macrolide treatment for heartworm. Some studies support it. In general, not widely supported. However, it's definitely less expensive for the owner, so that might be a reason that you see owners switching to moxidectin mixed with imidacloprid and doxycycline as a slow kill protocol. So looking at that overall, I guess we could talk about it now as well as loop back later. When we're looking at the potential to use macrolides, macrolide indecticides. So we talked about macrolide indecticides in last lecture, how they have broad spectrum nematode uh, coverage, which is great, and that would include heartworms. The trick with this, just as with moxidectin, it's a slow, slow, slow kill protocol. So some studies might suggest it as an alternative to no treatment at all, and that's kind of what it comes down to. However, in general, they're not recommended because it can take up to two years for that animal to get free of 95% of the adult heartworms. So if you imagine how long a dog lives for and the amount of damage that's done in two years of having a full-blown heartworm burden, that's pretty severe. So by the time they're free of heartworm, it's more likely that they're going to have permanent side effects in their heart and in their lungs from having an adult heartworm burden for so long. So in general, that's why we don't typically go for slow kill protocols. And most of those slow kill protocols, we're talking about macrolide indecticides as part of that protocol. In general, with adulticides, we never use them on cats. We never, ever, ever use them on cats. Cats, in general, the burden of adult parasites tends to be less severe in heartworm cases. They also get heartworm way less often than dogs. But in cats, you know, they might have a burden of adult heartworms, and it's only one to two worms, which that is a lot for the size of their hearts. But still, it's only one to two worms. It's not hundreds the way the dogs would be. The burden tends to last less time in general, so it's less lengthy. Cats have smaller anatomy. If you think about the size of a tiny little cat heart, they have a huge increased risk of blockage if we start to kill off these worms. And cats are at a higher risk of negative side effects of these drugs. So in general, we know how special cats are. We worry about breaking down these adult parasites and causing inflammatory reactions. So in some cases with cats, they'll just go in surgically to remove the adult heartworms. Likewise with dogs, if they have extremely heavy burdens, we have to be really careful because no matter how much glucocorticoids we give or any anti-inflammatories or Benadryl to prevent anaphylaxis, if they have a massive burden, we really risk that inflammatory process when those little worms break down, and we also risk seriously blocking some of those vessels with chunks of dead worm. So that's why oftentimes they require surgical removal. So we've tackled the adult worms, but what about their little besties, their homies, their little life partners? So we know from last week's lecture that they have this rickettsial bacteria 
called Wolbachia. And Wolbachia is that symbiotic bacteria. They work with the heartworm. They kind of support the adult heartworm. And then the adult heartworm supports Wolbachia as well. So they have that continuous relationship with each other. For that, we know we need a tetracycline antibiotic. So we're going to use doxycycline BID for four weeks. And in general, we're talking about killing off Wolbachia just to take away that helpful relationship from the heartworm. So essentially, Wolbachia is necessary for the parasite to develop, to thrive, to reproduce, and to maintain infectivity. Seriously, they're just little minions helping them out. And in general, if we give doxycycline, it reduces the pathology with the dead heartworms. It disrupts heartworm transmission. And of course, doxycycline is not an adulticide, but studies are indicating it reduces the length of treatment with adulticides. So really, really important now that when we're treating an animal for adult heart, heartworm disease, that we're also treating them with doxycycline as well as imidacide. So this is the protocol from the American Heartworm Society in 2014. This is what they recommend. It's on two pages. Step one, day one, begin exercise restriction. Stabilize the dog if it has life-threatening clinical signs secondary to heartworm infection. Administer a dose of monthly heartworm preventive. Use glucocorticoids or antihistamines if a large number of the microfilaria are present. Step two is day one to 28, administer doxycycline for 28 days. Step three is day 30, administer a dose of monthly heartworm preventive. Step four is day 60, administer a dose of monthly heartworm preventive. Give injection number one of melarsamine, which is the adulticide. Begin prednisone on a decreasing dose for four weeks. Step five, day 90 to 91, administer a dose of a monthly heartworm preventive. Give injection number two of melarsamine. Give injection number three 24 hours later. Begin prednisone on a tapering dose for four weeks and continue exercise restriction for six to, week, six to eight weeks after the last melarsamine injection. So this protocol is pretty intensive for the animal, for the owner, and of course for the vet clinic to ensure that they do it right. So looking at that protocol, it's a really high-end protocol. They have findings to say that it works. The challenge, of course, is it costs significant amounts of money. Melarsamine is quite expensive, admit aside. So that being said, we can't avoid it. When they need treatment, they need treatment. That's unavoidable. However, in areas of the world where heartworm is a problem, our best bet is to start our clients off with education. Why do we recommend heartworm prevention? Why in some areas are we recommending heartworm prevention year round? Well, I know it's expensive to buy heartworm prevention. However, if we look at this protocol, if your dog who's only two years old gets a full blown adult heartworm infection, you're probably gonna wanna treat that dog. And looking at the treatment, it's quite expensive. It's quite intensive. It's a whole process and it's very disruptive to their lives as owners as well. So just something to think about when we're talking about heartworm to clients, this is our role. Technically, we're interested in the long-term investment of their pet. That might mean cost-saving measures in the end, but we want to make sure that their pet doesn't even have to go down that path of heartworm infection. Moving on. So we talked about adulticides, and the main adulticide that we talked about is imidacide. That's the trade name. Melarsamine is the uh, generic name. Now we're going to look at microfilariocytes. So microfilaria are larval stage one and they're microscopic. The larvae are transmitted host to host through mosquitoes where they transform into that infective L3 larva and then move into the heart during maturation. Microfilariocytes block maturation into adults and they kill the microfilaria. Microfilariocide options, moxidectin mixed with imidacloprid is the only approved microfilariocide. So this product, Advantage Multi, has it on label 
that they are the only approved microfluoricide. So I suspect that Advantage Multi is going to protect that patent for as long as they can on their product, because right now they're the only ones that are on label. So if we break it down, Advantage Multi, we're looking at moxidectin, it's a milbomycin macrolide, antinema total drug mixed with imidacloprid. So then there's this other thought process, you know, that's a macrolide, antinema total drug, right? Moxidectin, macrolide. Could we use macrolides in general as microflaricides? So why can't we just grab any macrolide? Why can't we just grab iver ivermectin or salamectin? Some avermectins and milbomycins can be effective in killing various larval stages, but they're always off-label use. Okay, so definitely, yes, avermectins and milbomycins can be effective in killing various larval stages, but they're not on label. However, large burdens of microfilaria have resulted in mass death and serious harmful reactions in the host. So that's the risk that we take when, not us, but as the veterinarian, as the veterinarian is prescribing an off-label avermectin or milbomycin as a microfilaricide, they risk, if the animal has a large burden of microfilaria, we could risk mass death of these microfilaria and serious harmful reactions in the host. So that's why we tend not to just go ahead and grab like ivermectin or selamectin. We go for Advantage Multi. So then we have this slew of products for heartworm prevention. And you guys will get so familiar with these products, it will be sickening how much you'll know about these products. So these products, the key here, most of them are mixed products. So again, we go back to the goal of antiparasitic drugs when they're creating new antiparasitic drugs. Most of them want to get a one size fits all. They want that silver bullet. If I can get you one tablet that you take or you give your dog once a month and it will get roundworms, hookworms, lungworms, ticks, fleas, heartworm, then that's a golden ticket, right? That company is laughing because that's a golden ticket for them. Clients like an all-in-one product. So what you're going to see is a lot of confusing medications that are out there. And even better, the companies update them every single year to make them new and improved. So once you think you understand what products are out there on the market, surprise, you've got a lunch and learn coming up because they introduced a new word to it. <laughs> such as NextGuard, Spectra, <laughs> which I'll talk about. So looking at common preventatives that we have, definitely here in Canada, the States has way more than we do, but we just don't have approval for some of those products that the States do. I'm actually okay with that. So Ivermectin, we know that Ivermectin is a macrolide. So we're looking at, um, it's an Avermectin, and typically we're talking about ivermectin being present in HeartGuard. So HeartGuard is, I would say, one of the originals by Marielle. It's an old, old product. It's really great as general heartworm prevention along with other parasites. So typically internal nematodes. Selamectin is Revolution down there in the bottom left. And Revolution is one of the few products that maintains as one medicinal ingredient. So it's simply selamectin. Milbomycin, you can find an interceptor mixed with praziquantel. Milbomycin's also in sentinel mixed with lufeniron. You'll find milbomycin in trifexis, in Nexgard spectra, etc. So again, Milbomycin can be used as a heartworm preventive. That's fantastic. You'll see that it's mostly mixed with these other drugs to acquire some tick and flea prevention as well. One thing that's important to note about milbomycin and drugs that have milbomycin in the mix, especially for heartworm prevention, is they do have some protection against Bayless ascaris as well. So that's the typical raccoon roundworm that can get to humans. It's definitely zoonotic, creeps up into our central nervous system and into our eyes. So that's kind of nice that they have, a lot of those ones have that on label as well. 
And then we have moxidectin, which we talked about, Advantage Multi, and then previously we talked about moxidectin being in ProHeart 6. I just wanted to point out, I think in your textbook here, in the uh, Bill Pharmacology textbook, I think it says that Advantage Multi is orally given once a month. It is not. It is a topical medication. So just to keep that as a an edit. And then carrying on, uh, some benefits, of course, to these preventives, which are all our macrolide antinematodal drugs mixed generally with other drugs. Benefits, they have a low effective dose. So this is great for our collie friends, who you can see on the cover of that heart guard box. So minimal risk for collie type breeds and that MDR1 mutation. And of course, in general, it's minimal risk, but in general, a little bit of a lesson. RVTs, when you're giving out a product, especially ivermectin, but any of these products that has the potential to disrupt or cause disruptions in animals with the MDR1 mutation, just let the owner know if they've never had it before, you know, just monitor. Don't just give them the pill and go to work. Just monitor them for the first eight hours, okay? Especially ivermectin and especially if it's a collie. Who knows? Who knows? The other thing I just wanted to point out is ivermectin for cats. HeartGuard has it on label for cats to treat, or sorry, to prevent heartworm, which is excellent. Okay, let's recap because these products are wild. I'll just scroll through, get them all loaded up here. Okay. HeartGuard, ivermectin, and pyrantal. The ivermectin is antinematodal, it has some ectoparasite treatment, and it has heartworm prevention. Pyrantal, further hookworm prevention, pinworms, ascarids, and strongyles. More for large animals. If it was, anyways, that's what I'm just saying with the pyrantal medication itself. Revolution is selamectin. That will cover hookworms, roundworms, adult fleas, ear mites, ticks, and sarcoptic mange mites. Interceptor is milbamycin and praziquantel. Milbamycin will get heartworm prevention, hookworms, roundworms, demodex, ear mites, and canine whipworms. And then praziquantel, we know, will get tania, diplidium, and echinococcus. Sentinel, which is milbamycin and lufeniron. The milbamycin will get heartworm prevention, hookworms, roundworms, demodex, ear mites, canine whipworms, and the lufeniron is for fleas. And then I just sped it up on this one. Trifexis is milbamycin and spinosad. Milbamycin gets heartworm prevention, hookworms, roundworms, demodex, ear mites, canine whipworms, and spinosad gets fleas. Nexgard Spectra, which they also have just a plain old Nexgard, but we're talking here today about Nexgard Spectra, has milbamycin and alfoxalaner. Milbamycin gets heartworm prevention, hookworms, roundworms, canine whipworms, and alfoxalaner gets fleas and ticks. Advantage Multi is moxidectin and imidacloprid. Moxidectin is heartworm prevention, microflaricide, gastrointestinal antinematodal, sarcoptic mange, and of course it's the only approved microflaricide in combination. Imidacloprid gets fleas. ProHeart 6 is moxidectin, and of course moxidectin, we're looking at heartworm prevention. Whew. So, what you guys need to know, you may be able to memorize all of these, and I commend you if you can, but what would be more ideal is to get to know, in general, what these classes of drugs, what the themes are within the classes of drugs. So what are they able to prevent? What you've seen is a lot of the avermectins and the milbamycins are often used for heartworm pre prevention, as well as general antinematodal action, class them together, group them together, and then anytime you see that, you can start to pull out what specifically that drug might have an effect on. Likewise, we'll have a case study, we'll do some assignments that are looking at antiparasitic and heartworm medications. All right, moving on down the line, antiprotozoals. We have 
Ones that we've talked about before, coccidia, giardia, toxoplasmosis, and sarcocystosis, or sarcocystis that causes um, the equine encephalitis. So some of these are going to be review based on previous lectures, but we will talk about it regardless, just in less detail for some. So looking at coccidia, life cycle of coccidia, of course, we've got ingestion through the environment, maturation happens in the intestine, we find the osis in the feces, the sporulated osis contaminates food or drink, and then it starts the cycle again. One thing to note, a lot of these medications, well, not a lot of the medications, but some of the medications are widely used for poultry because coccidia in general is a huge problem with chicken farms. It creates a lot of loss if chickens are constantly having diarrhea, loss of fluids, so coccidia products are well distributed to poultry farms. So let's look at some products that can treat coccidia. Coccidia, I just want to point out too, if you work in shelter medicine, coccidia you will see a lot. So what we know about coccidia is that it can be self-limiting. So animals get it, and then as long as they have a good, strong, healthy immune system, it tends to potentially go away after not too long of a period of time. You start seeing it more in shelter type environments because those animals in those environments tend to have less of an immune system. They're under higher levels of stress and therefore their immune system can't fight off the coccidia the way it would if they were 100% healthy. So again, if you go into working with shelter medicine, shelter animals, just be prepared that you will see an awful lot of coccidia. So looking at the drugs that we use for coccidia, we have sulfonamide antibiotics. We have talked about sulfonamides before. What we find is definitely sulfonamides can work for coccidia. The one that is on label for dogs and cats is sulfa dimethoxide. So sulfa dimethoxide, which is albin, is on label for use in dogs and cats. It, as far as I know, is a little bit expensive and so we tend not to see it too too often in clinic. The way we use it we utilize a loading dose so a higher dose and then a maintenance which is a lower dose SID for five to seven days and essentially what's happening with these drugs is it creates folic acid and then it causes coccidiostatic effects. So folic acid synthesis to sort of trick the coccidia to think that it has folic acid when it in fact does not. So things to know about that, sulfa dimethoxide, it's a sulfonamide drug on its own, it's not potentiated, and it's on label for dogs and cats. However, we know that we often use potentiated sulfa drugs. So we have trimethoprin sulfadiazine, we have omethoprin, sulfa dimethoxin, trimethoprin, sulfa methoxazole. So all of those are definitely uh, medications that you might find in the vet clinic as well. I would say that the first one, tribersin, is the most common. And it's important to note, however, trimethoprin, sulfa methoxazole, septra, bacterin, those ones are human products. So the reason you might see the human products periodically in your clinic more often than the true vet products is because we generally can get human products way easier and way less expensive, unfortunately, um, than the veterinary approved products. So what we're finding is that human products have a ton of generic versions that we have access to that we're able to order from the pharmacy. So it is off-label, of course, in general, off-label. Um, but we're using human products more often so lately because they're less expensive. So anytime we're using a sulfonamide drug, we always have to remember to monitor for KCS, so that dry eye, and of course dehydration in general. We always want the animal to have access to water when they're on sulfonamide drugs. In part, the older sulfonamides used to cause those urinary bladder crystals, less so with the newer versions. But again, we want to make sure that we try to prevent dehydration at all costs. And we know that sulfonamides have been around forever in human medicine. So we just have to be aware that yes, we're treating coccidia, 
but we're using an antibiotic, so there is potential that we could cause random bacterial resistance. Things that we have to think about. Carrying on with coccidia medications, we have amprolium, which is also trade name Corid, Corid sorry, or Amprol. And the way these drugs work, they mimic the vitamin thiamine. So when the parasite essentially ingests these drugs, its body thinks that it has enough thiamine, and so it stops producing thiamine. So what ends up happening is the parasite ends up with a thiamine vitamin deficiency, and then they die. Poultry and calves typically is what we're using these products for. However, you might see them in your clinic as off-label for dogs. We do have to be careful. So because they are used fairly widely in poultry and calves, especially for um, chickens and poultry, they're often used as a food additive or a water additive. If we're using them in high doses or long term, we have to be really careful because super long term use, we can actually get thiamine deficiency in the host long term. So the mammal or the chicken that's eating this medication constantly can get thiamine deficiency. Typically it's long term, it's pretty low risk considering how quickly we slaughter animals, sadly, uh, but that is a potential side effect. Moving on down the line, Toltrazeril, I don't believe this one's in your textbook, it is also known as Baycox, and typically we're using it on livestock. It is off-label for dogs and cats. It's considered to be very safe. It inhibits protozoal, protozoal enzyme synthesis, and it's coccidiocidal, so it will actually kill off the coccidia. One thing about Toltrazeril, it tastes horrible. Cats hate it. So please mix it with some tuna water or something. It is awful stuff. Lastly, we have some ionophores. We already learned about these, um, how they work in large animal. We don't need to go into too much detail about them. The main thing to remember is that menensin is toxic to horses, so we don't use menensin in horses. Moving on down the line to Giardia. Looking at the Giardia cycle, we have contaminated waste, food, water, soil, or other. The dog or the animal or human comes in contact with the Giardia cyst, ingests it, and the body becomes infected with Giardia. Giardia cyst exits the body through excretion and survives in the environment for months, which is why animals always get reinfected, with the potential to infect others. And now, once it's in the body, the Giardia is a trophozoic within the small intestine multiplying while feeding off the host and absorbing its nutrients. So although Giardia look cute, they're very devastating and they're very zoonotic. So we don't like Giardia. Now these ones, we have almost talked about all of them. So we'll, we'll just breeze through them a little bit fast. Not fast, but we just won't go into too much detail. So drugs are often combined and I've talked about this before we often grab metronidazole that typically is the number one most prescribed drug for treatment of giardia however we know that metronidazole is not without its risks and it's not without its lack of efficacy on giardia so sometimes for some patients metronidazole works really really well a lot of times it doesn't work really really well and what we know is that we can only use um, metronidazole for about two weeks and then we have to take them off. So what we often do is mix drugs and we might send them home with a protocol of metronidazole and a benzimidazole, looking at the two combined together. So examples of benzimidazoles that we commonly use, we might use Safeguard, Panicure, sometimes we'll give them Febentol, which is Androndol Plus, and that one in particular is preferred for treating pregnant animals compared to metronidazole because metronidazole is scary for pregnant animals, not ideal. Albendazole is associated with a loss of appetite. We tend not to use that one much anyways. And either way, when we're looking at these drugs, except for Dronto Plus, we're talking about off-label use for dogs and cats. So fenbendazole and albendazole, we're talking about off-label use. But when we combine them with metronidazole, they can be really effective in helping to kick that infection. And metronidazole, we know all about it. It's additionally antibacterial, so it works on anaerobes. And remember, it has those gastrointestinal anti-inflammatory properties. It's off-label use. 67% of 
effective, so that's hit and miss, right? Might not work for everybody. Tastes horrible. And remember that we can get those crazy CNS side effects with prolonged or high dose use. And then we have the Giardia vaccine, which I'm just going to talk about briefly. We don't use it. It was taken off the market. So it's not a preventive at best. It just reduces the shedding of the cysts. It's on the AHA not recommended list. And generally, it gets pulled and then put back and then pulled off market just due to a lack of sales. I don't think we even have it in Canada. So I think we're okay there. But just it does exist, you know, things to be aware of. All right, and then lastly, we have toxoplasmosis and sarcocystosis. Same idea where we're talking about fecal oocysts that are passed with toxoplasma. We're talking about it embedding in tissue. So that's one thing that's a bit of a misconception. So when we talk about toxoplasma, most people think about getting toxoplasma when you're pregnant and cleaning out your cat's litter boxes. However, you're actually more likely to get it from eating undercooked meat because it embeds itself, the cysts embed itself into the muscle of common agricultural animals. Interesting facts. Not ideal, kind of gross, but sorry, pregnant ladies, unfortunately, we can still all clean the kitty litter boxes. But totally up to you. Don't risk it. Keep using that excuse too. Nobody wants to clean cat litter boxes. And then we have... Sarcocystis. <laughs> you can see I get distracted on my tangents. So sarcocystis, same idea. It's working its way through. The mature sarcocysts are in the muscle. And then of course, if we eat the undercooked meat, delicious, we get a parasite. Fantastic. So looking at treatment for these guys, clindamycin, which we talked about, <clears throat> known as antirobe in its trade name, it is a class of lincosamide antibiotic. And this one in particular, if we remember, it works on anaerobes. And it's the drug of choice for canine and feline toxoplas toxoplasmosis. However, it is off-label for toxoplasmosis. And then we have panazeril, which is the active metabolite of toltrazeril, so Baycox. The way we use this one, most often it's as this product called Marky. And Marky is used for equine protozoal control and it's to avoid sarcocystis or sarcocystosis which of course then uh, leads to the myeloencephalitis the equine myeloencephalitis so again these two products sometimes if you might need to use them we're talking about toxoplasmosis most often in the cat sometimes in large animal as well and um, the sarcocystosis in equines Okay, that's it. That's it. So for this lecture, things to note, again, know the difference between an adulticide and a microfilaricide and a heartworm prevention. Always remember what role doxycycline plays in the mix. Why do we use doxycycline for heartworm prevention or sorry, for heartworm treatment? And then slowly but surely start to get to know the heartworm products that are out there. Next week, when we start talking about ectoparasites, a lot of those products that are mixed in the heartworm products, you're going to start to see come up again and again, because we're talking about products that prevent heartworm. That's fantastic. But hey, they have another product that also treats fleas, ticks, whatever. So start getting to learn those drugs, what they do, and we'll continue to build on this as we go forward. Have a great day.